in any event, my name is Paul Saltzman. Uh, I'm a recently joined partner at the global law firm of White and Case. Uh, and Jalapa, thank you again for having me and for putting on this excellent event. Uh, I run their uh, global financial institutions regulatory uh, and advisory practice, which includes uh, fintech. And uh, I've got to tell you, I'm pretty intimidated by this audience. I've testified before the House, the Senate, um, arbitrated CEO disputes, but never been before an audience this esteemed with so many PhDs, so definitely the dumbest guy in the room. But I am definitely the dumbest guy on the panel, I'll tell you that much. I, I am joined by uh, three entrepreneurs who will give us their perspective on data aggregation and alternative data. Uh, Paul Gu, who's the, uh, one of the co-founders of Upstart, and as you know, uh, one of the few, if not only, CFPB, or I guess it's Bureau of BF something or other, the Consumer Bureau, let's put it that way. Um, uh, joined uh, uh, also is a substitute for the CEO, who unfortunately was sick. So Eric, thank you, Eric Becker, who's head of corporate development uh, at Urgenet. Uh, and last but not least, uh, to my uh, left, James Wu, who's a founder and CEO of Manja. So I think we'll follow the script. Uh, each of the panelists will give a, a brief introduction, and then uh, we'll pepper it up with questions uh, before lunch and, uh, and ask the audience. So uh, James, all yours. I think uh, they want you to go up there. All right, let me see if I can work this thing. Here's the mouse. Hi everyone, my name is James Wu. I am one of the founders and CEO of Manja. Uh, we're a company that started back in 2014, uh, focusing on credit underwriting and fraud management, valuation, and a bunch of other technology for online lending and fintech. Uh, my, fam my firm is really focused on helping our clients uh, in using data and AI for, for making various decisions. So today I'm gonna uh, dive in pretty deep on, on some of those. Um, in the earlier panel, I think um, the audience got, got a pretty good overview on the variety of data points uh, that can be used for either underwriting or fraud management or somewhere in the, in the consumer journey process. I think for this particular session, I'm going to dive in uh, from a slightly different angle and talk about some of our experiences in a pretty, pretty granular way. Um, so uh, here's my perspective on alternative data. The data has always been there. What's been different is our ability to collect a massive amount of data and the machine learning and AI technique to utilize this data for, for decisioning. So uh, like I said earlier, I, I want to get really granular. I'm a nerd by training. So <laughs> I'm going to jump in and, and talk about very specific examples here. All right, so here's, here's the first example about occupation and default risk. Uh, this is a good example of what I mean by using good technique, uh, of, of, by, by using new technique for, for decision. Um, using occupation and using professional titles is something that has been used uh, in a variety of instances, but one of the problems is the actual titles and occupations, they don't always match up with the official uh, classifications, especially when you have um, consumer reported data. In our own database, we have over several hundred thousand of unique job titles and occupations, so that makes it a pretty tough problem. But with the proper type of language processing and uh, clustering technique, you can actually use it as a fairly strong indicator. So, when you look at this, uh, when we look at this, we, we come to a couple interesting observations. So one is, you, you look at the, the different types of occupations, the risky occupations and, and, um, and safe occupations. Of course, some of this is grouping, but um, you know, I, I've shown this data to, uh, to a couple of pretty senior, uh, and, and actually more granular data to a couple of pretty senior um, uh, underwriters and, uh, and credit officers, and their observation is like, wow, this lines up with a lot of their intuition. Uh, it's not just about 
you know, whether you have high income or low income, but it's also about, uh, in, you know, in the traditional five C's of underwriting, the character of it. There's something that's somewhat intangible uh, that traditionally gets baked into credit underwriting, now actually gets, uh, get, gets incorporated into a quantitative analysis, which is something that hasn't been done uh, in a lot of traditional data analysis, right? No, now, another thing about intuition is traditionally, intuition is a little bit of a dirty word in, in credit underwriting and in fraud management and, and so on, because it can be sometimes uh, used as a substitute for bias. Um, one of the uh, interesting aspects of, about having this in a data uh, and a data-driven model is you can actually examine it and uh, get more transparency on exactly what's happening underneath the, the hood. All right, here's another example of how traditional and non-traditional data is used to judge something that traditionally is something that's more qualitative and quantitative. Um, and I should mention that uh, some of our work is, uh, is in small business. This is an actual example of a borrower pulled from the social media uh, review of a business borrower. I think it's a sandwich shop. Um, now, if you're a human underwriter and you read this, you're like, okay, this is terrible, uh, right? <laughs> As a sandwich shop, this is not somewhere I want to go to and uh, probably not someone you want to lend money to. But from a quanti quantifiable basis, how do you teach m a machine learning algorithm to, um, to recognize this. Uh, and we've come up with uh, a couple of techniques to do so. And, and uh, actually, there is now a, a growing academic literature on how to do this type of analysis. And, and what's really interesting is y when you think about the using data like this for underwriting, you don't just think about their creditworthiness. From a small business perspective, when you're lending business, when you're lending money to a small business, much of what you're trying to do is risk management. And this, this is actually why uh, a lot of earlier efforts on using a score-based underwriting for small business failed. Because it's not, small business lending is not really like uh, lending to, to a consumer. You're not just trying to figure out their willingness to pay and their, their capacity to pay. Uh, you, you also want to figure out uh, the, the tail risk that may, may be there in a business, right? Uh, a business might, a, a small mom and pop shop might have a major retailer popping up across the street, right? A sandwich shop may get shut down because of health code violations. These are things that, as a human underwriter, traditionally you do, you do a site visit and you understand the business and you really incorporate and internalize this knowledge. Um, but using machine learning and actually a lot of data stream, alternative data stream, we can start to do some of this. All right. Um, next, this is an area that's interesting uh, from a development perspective, and I should add, this is, again, typically used for risk management and not really for underwriting, for income distribution. The, the reason this is a big topic is um, for, for a variety of reasons, but one of the many reasons is for income verification. For online lenders and direct lenders, um, the ability to be able to streamline the customer journey is very important. So if you, if you can avoid extensive verification of income, it's very important. Uh, and, and, but of course, selectively, you do have to figure out which ones to verify and which ones you don't. So being able to come, come up with a estimate of what the income is as a basis for verifying against uh, initial verification, initial check against borrower provider data is something that is uh, used a lot in our experience. Um, so obviously when you're estimating income, when you're estimating plausible income, census data is, is a very good starting point. The challenge there is usually uh, that there is not a lot of granularity. But by combining census data with a couple other data streams, um, uh, such as uh, you know rent, uh, rent level, property transaction level, um, 
GPS tracking, uh, aggregate information, uh, commuter patterns. You can start getting, pulling a lot of the streams together and get very, very granular estimate, um, sometimes even on a block level, on what the plausible income would be. So from a fraud management uh, and workflow perspective, this can be a uh, very, very powerful tool. And uh, you know, back to the application I said earlier, it really, it's really helpful to help figure out which borrowers you actually need to uh, ask for additional verification, which ones you might even have to consider calling up their employer. Um, okay, this is another angle, Google Street View. Uh, from a traditional underwriting and traditional um, uh, application review typically re, uh, involves site visits. And that, that obviously is, is something that, should, that, that um, prudent underwriting should incorporate, especially for, um, for lending applications that involve some kind of property and, uh, and, and locality aspects, such as commercial, commercial real estate. Uh, but using Google Street View and other similar data, it often gives you uh, the ability to do a first pass. So this is an example of uh, machine learning picking up from Google Street View data specific attributes that might be, that might be un undesirable, again, from a risk management perspective. All right, and, and just overall, when you think about machine learning and, and these other techniques, it can really help you add a context to the overall application. Um, and rather than using it as a singular underwriting point on its own. Okay. Um, in the previous panel, a, a couple of CEOs mentioned the ability to use transaction and cash flow data, and that's very, very important. Uh, we work with lenders and financial institutions that often don't have that level of granular electronic data uh, ready-made. Uh, sometimes the, the data is, sometimes the, the application is handwritten, uh, which is terrible. Uh, and even with, even with machine generated statements, it's often in a scanned format that can, cannot be easily ingested. But the technology for OCR has evolved quite a bit so that you can actually digitalize and utilize the underlying data to understand exactly what's going on with the bank statement. All right. This last example, this is not really data aggregation. This is a chatbot we built for one of our clients for, uh, for internal processing. But chatbots uh, overall has been used also quite a bit from a customer acquisition uh, and initial customer qualification perspective. It's also another powerful uh, tool in the arsenal. And in the process of getting the customer in and qualifying, you can get a lot of information that can be aggregated as part of the overall customer journey process. All right, so in summary, um, we think there's a huge opportunity for, for providing credit, uh, especially in areas that were previously underserved. Um, not just millennials, uh, but also small businesses uh, and a lot of um, customers that previously were difficult to solve from a quantitative and streamlined perspective. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to regulatory issues, of course, uh, but it's just, it's very striking to hear credit officers telling us that that you know, this is th this is very interesting because uh, I, I, this one credit officer said, you know, I was reviewing this one file and something just didn't smell right, and I was went went back home and was just turning and twisting a bit, and I set up and realized what's going on and and realized what to look for, and I, I, that's how I think about alternative data and AI and the promise of it. It's not about denying opportunity to people, but helping uh, credit underwriters, financial institutions with painting a more complete picture and really being able to take more risk uh, and broaden access of credit uh, to people that were previously underserved. And, um, and we are very excited about this. Thanks.
I work help desk. <laughs> uh, well, my name is Eric Becker. I'm with Urgenet, and I think um, James, that last presentation was very helpful. I have a 20-year-old uh, daughter who's in college, and she's looking at career options right now. And I now know that we should cross off mortgage banker, massage therapist, and uh, <laughs> so this has been, you know, worth my time already. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation this morning about the underbanked, and I'm excited to share a little bit about kind of how we view that market and some of the things that we're doing to address the needs in that space. There's a lot of data on sizing it, but no matter what data you look, look at, it's, it's clearly huge. Um, you know, the FDIC says that 23% 23, 23 of all Americans are underbanked today, meaning they're not using traditional checking accounts and savings accounts. Um, you can go ahead and look at CFPB, who says that 50 million Americans are credit invisible, which means they have no data on file with any of the three major bureaus. Um, it's shocking, but of course that means that they're steered towards financial products that are very, very expensive for them. And it's not just consumers, it's businesses. If you take a look at around the world, there's about 160 million businesses that also don't have access to um, the types of uh, credit and, and banking services that would help them make their businesses um, grow and more profitable. And then if you just look at the payment space, there's 4 billion humans on the planet that are still conducting most of their transactions via cash. So um, this probably doesn't look a lot like the world that most of the people in this room live in, but it's real for these people. And we know who they are, right? They're uh, all around the world. They're people who are new to credit. These can be students. Immigrants, it can be people who've had some experience with credit but had a bad experience and trying to get back into the credit market. But for them, it's a massive problem because, as, a, as has been shared earlier today, um, they either can't tap into the uh, financial products that most of us enjoy or they do so at rates that are harmful and, and very, very expensive for them. And so, uh, but while there's a, where there's a huge problem for the consumers, there's also a massive opportunity for those in the financial services space to meet these people's needs. Um, there, it is estimated that on a global basis, if we could, if the financial services industry could sell to these people, they'd have 100 million new consumers they could be working with. That's massive for them. And if you look at aggregate spending for these consumers over the course of their lifetime, they're expected to transact about $380 billion in economic activity, all of which the financial services industry could play some role in. So that is huge, right? So how do we bridge the gap between these consumers who have a need to tap into traditional financial services products and the desires of the financial services industry to meet these needs while still doing it in a way that's profitable? This is the problem that we're setting out to solve, and that is by leveraging alternative data to do this. Um, and it's an exciting time, I think, right now, because um, alternative data by itself is not enough but it also requires a lot of the other technologies that have been discussed here this morning, including it's really alternative data in combination with things like AI and machine learning and kind of the massive infrastructure that's available through cloud computing. It's really the convergence of all these things that's really helping bridge this gap for the first time. UrgeNet, we're just focused on the data piece of it. So we're the first company that's built a technology platform for aggregating utility telco and cable data. So this is done before, you're probably familiar in the banking industry. So folks like Yodley, Plaid, Mint.com, they built similar platforms for aggregating financial data. Urgenet's the first company that's done this for utility data. A Couple things that are important about our service. One is it's all consumer permission. So we are not building a bureau of data um, uh, we are doing all this in a consumer permission fashion where the consumers who are working with our partners, the lenders and the bureaus, are authorizing us to access their information on their behalf for a particular source. And then we're providing this information to our partners directly from the utility. So, for example, the consumers not being asked to upload copies of their utility bills or their telco statements, they're permissioning us to, uh, or permissioning our partners to access that data, and then we're fetching that data and delivering it to our partners directly from the source, from the utility company or the telco provider. Since we've launched our platform, we've now processed millions of transactions. In fact, in aggregate, we process, we've uh, uh, analyzed payment history for over $70 billion of utility spend at this point. The platform itself is now integrated with 5,000 utilities in total, and that we're adding about 100 new utility connections per month. 
and the platform is live in 43 countries around the world. Um, so uh, we've you know, spent a lot of time building this out and are seeing some real traction in the marketplace around this. The reason it's working, though, is because it benefits the consumer also. What we've seen, and our partners at Experience have, have written a white paper on this, is that you know, when asked, when you ask a consumer to go ahead and link and share additional financial information, at least 70% of the time they'll do that if they're given a, given a good incentive um, for doing that. And what's also been shown is that there is good incentive for them to do that because that is that, you know, for near prime customers, when they share things like utility data, they see an uplift in their score, um, a 60% uplift in the score. So that's a huge, huge help. So the market opportunity is really massive, um, as we've talked about. Lots of customers, um, both consumers and small businesses, a huge amount of kind of financial activity surrounding um, this market. And it's really, I think, the convergence of all the stuff that's being talked about here this morning, alternative data combined with tools um, that allow lenders and underwriters to analyze this data that creates an exciting moment now where we can really, for the first time, um, help the underbanked become understood. Thank you. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Paul Gu. I'm one of the co-founders of Upstart. Um, we are a online uh, lending platform. Uh, we work with both uh, bank partners to originate. We also originate uh, with uh, state licenses directly. Um, and uh, one of the things that, uh, that we're known for doing is using alternative methods and data in underwriting to expand access to credit. Um, I will, um, I think uh, lots of others have talked about many other uh, types of data that are useful. I'll touch on that a little bit, but mostly I want to talk about um, why I think it's so beneficial to do um, alternative underwriting and uh, some of the results that we've seen to date. Uh, so first, uh, our mission, uh, our mission statement as a company is to enable effortless credit based on true risk. Um, really two notions here. Uh, the first is this notion of true risk, this idea that um, if you knew everything there was to know about a person, then you would actually know what their risk level is. And of course, all the um, models that exist and even the ones we use are just approximations of that. And our goal really should be to strive towards getting closer and closer to the truth in understanding uh, whether or not someone will uh, be able to pay back. Uh, and the second piece is making it effortless. Uh, what we know about consumers is that uh, they're very sensitive to uh, the difficulty of doing something. And uh, so if you built a system that uh, was really good at understanding risk but really hard to get through, probably no one would do it and you would still make no impact on, uh, on consumers. Um, so uh, the, the sort of basics, I think, of why uh, we're all here today at this conference is uh, talking about um, you know, the, the traditional ways of assessing consumer credit. They're based on the bureaus. And uh, you know, this data, while I think it has gotten uh, better in the context of sort of the credit data, is still mostly just credit data. Um, and uh, of course, that only will get you so far. Um, so, uh, so the first uh, thing that we sort of think about when we, when we think about the potential for alternative underwriting is uh, we look at what um, default rates are in the sort of different uh, sort of traditional bands of, of primeness. And so this is uh, what, uh, what we observe um, in, uh, in our industry, online personal loans. It probably numbers a little bit higher than you would see in other industries because online personal is probably the single riskiest segment. You're you know, giving people uh, big chunks of money online uh, and, uh, and you know, they, they, they don't have anything securing it. It's not like a credit card where uh, if they pay you back, they can keep using it. There's really just, you know, it's sort of the bottom of the payment stack always, and that's why you see some pretty high default rates. And so, you, you know, you look at some of these segments that would traditionally be called near prime or subprime, um, and you see some pretty high numbers, like 20%, 30% default rates, and you say, wow, that's really high. Um, and of course, if you're, you're um, you know, most banks, you would say, we really want to stay away from this segment where we're getting 20% loss rates. Um, and that's, that's totally right, except um, if you pause for a second and think, 
what does it mean if there's a 33% default rate on this pool of loans? Well, it means that there's 67% of them that didn't default. And um, if you classified this population, say the 580 FICO population, as just like bad people that we don't want to lend to, well, what you've actually done is, is classified a pool like that where the vast majority of that pool, two thirds of them, would have actually paid you back. And so, um, so that's really um, a, a sort of a big opportunity missed. Um, and, uh, and, and I think a useful way of thinking about it is whatever the default rate is, it's almost certainly not so high that there aren't more non-defaulters than defaulters. And so the challenge really is, can you identify those people reliably enough that you can pick up some of those people without also picking up the 33% um, default rate? Um, when you sort of condense that uh, down and, uh, and sort of put it into a single metric, um, this, is, uh, this is sort of um, our working model of it, where we think about uh, half of Americans have access to prime credit based on factors like their, their uh, traditional credit scores. And uh, we think that if you sort of were uh, omniscient, you would have been willing to lend to something like 83% of Americans. In fact, that's the number that have actually never defaulted um, on, on any sort of uh, credit obligation. And so there's, there's a huge gap there. It's not like, um, you know, when we talk about alternative uh, underwriting, we don't think the opportunity is like expanding your business by 10%. We think it's really uh, almost half the population that is significantly um, undervalued by the traditional ways of underwriting. <clears throat> so uh, what is it that, uh, that we do specifically? Um, uh, I'll touch on this uh, quickly, but mostly I want to share uh, results uh, since I think that's, that's ultimately what matters. Um, so the, the data sources we use, um, we use a bunch of different uh, alternative data sources and, and traditional data sources, starting with the credit file. We use that very extensively. Uh, we use some data about a person's educational background. Uh, we use some of the things like occupations uh, that James talked about um, that, that are really quite useful. Um, there's some data about um, uh, so, sort of data related to a person's uh, other sort of financial factors, um, some of it coming from uh, bank accounts, some of it coming related to a person's location. Uh, and then finally, there's sort of a whole bunch of web behavioral type attributes um, that you can just get from the way a person's interacting with your application. Um, there's also um, a handful of sort of non-credit bureau FCRA uh, uh, approved type uh, data vendors that can give you additional data, often related to bank accounts and things like this. Um, all of that data um, basically gets fed into a, uh, an ensemble of machine learning algorithms that we've built up over the course of the past five years. Um, the, the biggest piece of those um, algorithms for us is, is a particular algorithm called XGBoost. It's a very um, uh, commonly used uh, machine learning algorithm. And, um, and really the key point here is that um, I think in order to effectively use a whole bunch of alternative data points, you need to also have learning algorithms that are strong enough to be able to, to use them. Uh, and one of the reasons that is, is that a lot of these alternative data points, they're, they're alternative because they are not the most important thing. Um, meaning, if I had to only pick one source of data, hands down, I would pick the credit bureau data. Um, but if I could take 10 sources of data instead of one, of course, I would rather take the 10. But then you have this challenge of how do you effectively utilize all of that data? Um, and when you feed it into algorithms that are a little bit more flexible than sort of the traditional scorecard or the traditional sort of straight line regression, uh, then you can actually make use of a lot of this data in ways that uh, you wouldn't uh, traditionally have been able to. Um, so, uh, so on to the results. Um, so I'm going to talk about results in, in, in a sort of a series of different slides, where this first slide will be what I'd call um, theoretical. Theoretical in the sense that this is, uh, this is, these are actual numbers, uh, but they are sort of in the lab, if you will. They're things that we sort of produced on our computers, and uh, you know, uh, different companies could produce uh, graphs that look something like this, but then of course you have to go out and see how it is in the real world, but sort of starting with a the theoretical perspective, um, these are uh, these are uh, these are uh, uh, KS graphs where we've sort of separated the uh, the good borrowers and the bad borrowers according to different models on our actual uh, loan population. Um, so um, uh, you can see that for uh, the sort of traditional FICO score, if you only use the FICO score, and again. Uh, just using the FICO score in online lending, that would be uh, that would be very challenging to do. You can see that there's definitely some good separation between the the good sort of 
uh, borrowers and the bad borrowers, um, but it's fairly small. Um, then you get to a, a, what I call full traditional model, which is really our, our um, best effort, and we actually keep on hand a traditional logistic regression type model that uses um, actually several hundred attributes from the credit report. So this is a sort of full-fledged um, best effort um, uh, traditional uh, credit model, and you get a, quite a nice improvement over uh, the FICO score. Um, then you get to uh, this model we call contract. Uh, really what it means is it refers to uh, a, an early version of the upstart scoring model um, where we took all those uh, alternative factors I talked about earlier, used some of the machine learning techniques but not all of them, and, um, uh, and had an early version of our model that had limited training data, limited learning algorithms, and uh, not all of those sources of alternative data yet available. And you can see that you get this pretty significant improvement. I, I think um, you know, most lenders will be pretty happy to see uh, an improvement from 25 to 30. Um, and then uh, the final model here, state of the art, that's the version of the model we have in production today. Um, that's the result of about five years of, uh, of um, investment in these algorithms. And it's both the result of just more data getting collected as the data comes in, our models update and get better. Um, but it's also the result of a lot of uh, research and development work that we've put into it, both finding and we're constantly sort of back testing new sources of, of data that can be useful and then we're also um, uh, testing different kinds of learning algorithms to see if they can uh, improve the overall efficacy of the models. So it uh, looks like a really big improvement uh, on paper. Uh, let's see uh, if it uh, translates into reality. So, um, so this is, uh, this is one, uh, one way we like to look at the data. Um, it's um, necessarily a little estimated, but basically what we did was we took data from uh, Morgan Stanley uh, sort of online marketplace deal tracker, uh, where they basically track all these securitizations, and securitizations are nice in that the data is uh, what I call semi-public in the sense that there are these deal trackers and they have the loss rates on them. You can also go on Intex and see basically the same numbers. Um, and uh, you know, depending on the source, you get slightly different numbers, but the ballpark is basically the same. And the key point we're making here is really to say that if you look at most lenders in the industry, you see sort of this pretty straight line trade-off between uh, FICO scores of the sort of loan pools and their, uh, their loss rates. Um, if you do the same thing and you look at the upstart pool, you see a much flatter line. Um, and you see that for credit scores below 720 or 700, you start to get really significant separation in the realized loss rates of our loan pools compared to what you would typically see in the industry. Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this is one way of looking at the data that is, is actuals. And you know, if, uh, if we were right that on paper we were getting this massive KS improvement from like 25 to 45, then you would expect that for lower credit scores, we should be able to generate a huge amount of actual separation and performance, um, and that's uh, that's what you see here. Sorry, are those actuals These are actuals. Yes, actual yeah, they're uh, <laughs> uh, they're they're basically actuals with the nuance that actuals are sort of estimated because the numbers here are, are annualized and uh, annualizing loss rates. Well, you have to decide on a methodology. It, it turns out it doesn't really matter what methodology you choose. You get basically the same shape of graph, but the numbers can like bounce around a little bit. Um, so uh, another way of looking at the data um, is uh, is to say, okay, well, what what's another way we can compare our actual results to what you would typically expect in the industry? Well, one way is again you can go back to the securitizations and look at the actual loss rates compared to uh, bond rating agency expectations. So we've done now. Uh, Four, I think four uh, uh, rated securitizations, and um, each uh, each pool of these loans basically goes through um, review by a rating agency, and they look at the types of loans going into the pool, and they say, okay, based on what we've seen in the industry, what would we typically expect uh, loss rates to be? And um, and then they, they assign uh, estimated loss rates. You can find these um, on their website, and uh, in our deals, and most of the deals in our industry are rated by Kroll. Um, you can just go on Kroll's website and, and, and replicate these numbers for yourself. Um, so what this graph is, is the, uh, the actual loss rates on each pool of loans after the securitization is done compared to the initial expectations from the rating agency. These are all of the deals uh, where this data was available in our industry, again, online personal loans. And you can see that um, typically lenders in our space have actuals that are a little bit above what the Kroll base case is. Um, but the two green dots here, those are the, the first two upstart deals. The next two are, going, are, are about in about the same place, but they're not, uh, not uh, deeply seasoned yet, so I didn't want to include them because we wanted to only filter for uh, deals that have at least been seasoned for uh, one year. 
Um, what you can see is that um, Upstart's uh, deals are among the only field deals that are significantly beating their, uh, their rating agency loss assumptions. And again, that's exactly what you would expect based on this graph. If we were really producing loss rates for uh, credit scores that are sub 700, that are like in the range of you know, 30, 40, 50% less than uh, what you typically see, then you would also expect that when rating agencies go to rate us, at least on early deals, they wouldn't have fully baked that in and we would beat those numbers. And again, that is actually what you see. Um, so uh, the, um, the really great thing about this, of course, is that this is a graph of loss rates in FICO scores, but uh, it could just as easily be a graph of FICO scores and APRs. Um, because when we can get lower loss rates for a pool of borrowers that traditionally have very high loss rates, then we don't need to charge them the kinds of APRs that other lenders need to charge them because we can, uh, we can get the loss rates much lower. And so, for example, uh, if you were to look at that 640 population, uh, the rates that we can offer to borrowers in that segment are dramatically lower than they could get elsewhere, hundreds of basis points, because the loss rates we achieve in that segment are uh, also dramatically lower. Just uh, 30 more seconds. Okay, yep, uh, basically done. Um, so uh, sort of uh, putting this all together, um, you know, we have over the course of the past uh, six years uh, used uh, these alternative data and alternative underwriting techniques uh, to build uh, what we think is a, a fairly well-rounded business. Um, of course, we have a business that is growing and, and profitable, um, and, uh, and we, uh, we expect that will uh, we'll continue. Uh, we have worked directly with regulators, uh, especially the CFPB, in uh, making sure that regulators understand uh, what it is that we're doing and why it's beneficial to consumers. Uh, we've done the investment grade securitizations and uh, worked with the capital markets to get them to also uh, buy in. And of course, um, we have a very high consumer ratings on places like Credit Karma, where consumers who are uh, finding rates that are uh, much better than they could get elsewhere are uh, naturally very excited to, to be a part of it. Um, Okay, that's all. Thank you. For a little crunch for time, I'm going to ask uh, just maybe one or two questions and then uh, open it up uh, to the floor. So um, maybe could each of you provide a little bit more color on how you see your offering relative to the credit underwriting process and human intervention? I mean, is each of your products meant to be determinative of an underwriting outcome? a tool, uh, are, there, are there alternative models? Could you maybe enlighten the, the, the group a little bit more in terms of the composition of the underwriting process? Yeah. I, can, I can start off just by saying that, you know, Urgent, we don't produce underwriting mod, uh, models at all. Uh, we rely on our partners to do that, so we focus really on the, uh, well, for us, it's a very challenging problem, just aggregating the data, but we focus on that and then providing the data to our partners who, are you know much more much more able to kind of do the type of modeling that you're you're describing, James? How do you think about it? From a model construction perspective, I think using alternative data it, uh, does give a big advantage. But one of the, um, I, I guess, surprising in, uh, in the beginning, but obvious in retrospect, one of the biggest advantage. Um, for using an alternative uh, approach and being able to create underwriting models and fraud detection models um, using alternative data is you can now decision on, on cases that were previously not possible or previously had to be fully manual underwriting. So this is not an example of using logic model versus machine learning model for consumer, but this is about um, compare with a full manual underwriting for small business, which takes weeks and weeks and weeks, uh, and accelerate that to uh, underwrite in just days. Paul, how do you think about the uh, upstart algorithm and the degree of human interaction? Yeah, so um, uh, we, we think of our underwriting as uh, fully automated. Um, so someone can come to the website, um, you know, fill out a form, and then we pull some uh, data about them. And over the course of you know, the next few seconds, they will uh, get a decision and a rate. Now, uh, that decision is conditional on the information they provided to us being true, because some of it is uh, borrower provided. And then there's a verification process. Um, uh, uh, for us today, the verification process in, um, I think it's uh, last month, about 62% of all our loans were fully automated, meaning they were able to get through verification without 
uh, without any uh, sort of human touch or significant work by the applicant. Um, in the remaining cases, uh, there was a human touch, and so someone was reviewing uh, some, something about the application. There was possibly a document uploaded, et cetera. I'm going to run through questions quickly, again, in the interest of time. So, uh, Paul, let me pick on you just for a quick second. Uh, the no action letter, uh, how important uh, uh, was the receipt of that in terms of your operating model? And um, obviously, other panelists, any other concerns about disparate impact? Because, again, looking at the alternative data sources, one can construct, you know, a real plaintiff's, uh, you know, argument um, that we're going to hear a little bit later about. Uh, from some litigators, but how important was the no action letter to your progress? Yeah, so you know, fr from the from the start, I think we um, we were very conscious of uh, of sort of the risks in this area, and so we took care to to do testing uh, very early on and to be very thoughtful about our compliance around this. So I think even prior to the letter, we felt um, very good about our position that. Um, we were doing something that would be very beneficial to consumers, that it would not uh, create disparate impact. And, um, uh, and, and, and of course, that was our sort of internal position. Um, I think what, uh, what the letter really helped with was our ability to work with a variety of external partners. Um, so now we work with, uh, in addition to the capital markets for whom this was, uh, this was uh, something that, that sort of helped mitigate some of their concerns. It also, um, it also really helped our ability to work with additional uh, bank partners. Um, and uh, you know, the future for, for us really is in working with more and more bank partners. And the reason is that bank partners uh, have, uh, have the lowest cost of funding in the market. And if we want to get consumers uh, the best uh, credit out there, we want to give as many people as possible access to the lowest possible rates. That's sort of, um, you know, what, what we aim to do. Then, uh, then we need to work with banks because banks have lower cost of funding than we ever will. And, um, and uh, the, the no action letter was a huge help in enabling that, those conversations to start. Any other thoughts from the panel? The, the, in terms of, um, again, the, uh, I'm not gonna ask you if you're the chocolate or the peanut butter, but uh, um, in terms of dealing with banks, uh, what's been your uh, experience from a regulatory perspective uh, vendor risk management, obviously uh, you're in some cases a vendor. Um, uh, model validation we heard about, our banks holding you to, uh, our, our banks passing through similar model validation standards to you. So how is it dealing with your bank partners and what recommendations would, would you have about the regulatory environment to make that um, easier and to promote innovation? Let me start with you, James. <laughs> I think the biggest ob observation for us is particularly in working with small and me medium-sized banks, it's not about banks versus fintechs, but the larger picture is about smaller uh, and mid-sized banks competing with uh, the largest banks. For them, having access to, to uh, automation and algorithms really enable them to level the playing field. So this, in, in many ways, is, is not really about um, one industry versus another, but ultimately about providing access to data and techniques and technology that makes it possible for even smaller institutions. Yeah, it's probably no surprise that as a vendor to a bank or a credit bureau, they carry, care immensely about the issue of, uh, of security. And so, you know, we've been forced to do all those things that you would expect us to do, you know, GDPR and SOC and all those things are, are critical. I think one of the things that they appreciate about our model are two things. One is that all the data we're providing is consumer permission, so they take comfort in that. And the other is we're not creating a bureau of data. So, you know, it's very hard to protect a bureau of data from getting hacked because the information is so valuable. There's massive incentives for people to get after it. So what we've really done is built something different. It's an on-demand platform where anyone wanting to do a transaction can get access to this data in a consumer permission way on to, uh, in real time on demand. So I think our, our, our partners uh, definitely take comfort in that. Paul, any observations? Uh, yeah, so so I mean, for sure, when uh, when we've worked with banks, uh, we've gone through um, we've gone through very lengthy uh, diligence processes. Um, uh, we've done a lot of work on ensuring that uh, that our our models uh, make sense uh, in in the context of their business and their regulatory framework, um, their uh, their populations, etc. Um, there's definitely a, um, a lot of work that goes into. Uh, model validation. Um, I think uh, probably, you know, one of the things that, um, 
that, uh, that that's really worked well for us is in making sure that we first align on what the objectives of um, of, uh, of sort of the various pieces of the diligence are, um, as opposed to getting too bogged down in kind of the exact procedural way that they are used to doing it, because those won't always apply to us. Um, but in many cases, we can solve for the same objectives, um, just uh, with a slightly modified procedure, um, and that, um, that's that been very helpful in making those conversations. Great. We have a host of questions, but uh, we'll uh, hear from the audience uh, in the interest of time and lunch. Uh, we'll take two questions, uh, Melissa. Fast. Melissa Coide, Finreg Lab. Paul, your default rate comparing Upstart to the other companies, what was notable was it was you guys and SoFi that were below the line. What is unique about the data that you all are using, not to be too myopic here, but it is education data. Do you have a theory about how much that data in particular is actually controlling for or assessing risk and controlling for defaults? Yeah, so, so um, we are uh, obviously a very different company than, than SoFi. I think they're doing a lot of interesting things, um, but they're really focused on the super prime space. So if you, um, if you sort of look at that graph, they are um, you know, at the sort of what I call bottom right of the graph. They have very low loss rates, um, but also uh, you know, very high FICO scores and, and very high exclusivity. It's not, it's not really something that um, you know, the, the, the mainstream consumer is necessarily meant to be able to qualify for, um, whereas uh, our goal is, is quite different. Um, uh, it is true that uh, we, are, uh, we are two of the lenders that consider education data in some way. I think we, uh, you know, I, I, can't, I can't speak for them exactly, but I suspect that we consider it in a, in a much more nuanced way where um, we, are, uh, we tend to be turning data points into sort of continuous uh, quantitative measures instead of sort of having lists of uh, sort of approved schools or not approved schools, things like that. Um, that just may be difference in history of uh, not having started as a student lender. Um, but, uh, but yeah, for sure, education data is, uh, is predictive. Uh, it's quite valuable. When we started the company, it was the first set of uh, non-traditional data that we went to. Um, in fact, our sort of original uh, theory of the business, if you will, was as simple as there are a bunch of young people out there who don't have a lot of credit history. What kind of history do they have that would be relevant? Oh, they have a lot of education history because they probably just graduated. So if we use that, then we can get some lift in these models. And uh, that hypothesis turned out to be true. Um, surprisingly, it turns out to actually be useful for uh, even people who graduated uh, more than a few years ago. Um, but, uh, but yeah, for sure it's predictive, um, but it's, uh, it's only one set of factors in our model. Great, great. Shout it out. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Andy from Bank of America. So my question is simple. This morning we hear a lot of the discussion about alternative data and its application in retail banking side. So what's your view of using alternative data in wholesale? Uh, wow. Sorry, in wholesale markets. In wholesale, especially some of the businesses are relationship-based. Oh, yeah. Um, so t to be, uh, you know, to be transparent, uh, I don't have a lot of experience with that. We have been strictly a uh, U.S. consumer to date. Um, I think uh, I would suspect that um, there's very good potential there. I think the problems are harder, but uh, the opportunity is in some ways bigger. Um, so uh, I, I, I definitely expect that someone will be doing it. Yeah, no, and, and uh, we don't, I don't have a lot of direct experience in that market either, but I can tell you our partners have, have a keen interest in using the type of alternative data that we provide um, across, you know, for lots of different segments of the industry. But um, they would be, I think, be able to give you some more information than, than I could about that. Any other things to say? I was going to say for wholesale, um, th there's been some, some interesting studies and, and actual data points, and it looks promising, but in, in our experience for wholesale market, traditionally, biggest obstacle has been processes because wholesale given the given the the, the dollar amount and uh, the value of uh, many of the relationships uh, it has traditionally resisted automation and algorithm uh, algorithm centric underwriting but that said um, you know it maybe it takes maybe it takes a generation or two to change but it will change 
Okay, in the interest of time and lunch, I want to thank our panelists for giving us the uh, Chalupa, any instructions for lunch? Okay, I guess lunch. <laughs>